Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lauren McEvitt, and as a board member of DMA, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, which I will be chairing on behalf of our audiences in London, Monrovia, and online. The UK-Liberian relationship when it comes to energy diversification and economic development has never been more important than it is today, not only for our trading and economic connections, but in the run-up to COP26, also for our shared commitment to tackling the threat that climate change and environmental upheaval present to our world. It is our shared hope that this event, and events like it, will create the connections and ideas that will allow businesses and economies to thrive while protecting the environment for generations to come. I would like to begin today by thanking our hosts, the Embassies of Liberia in the UK and the UK in Liberia, for providing us the space to put on this hybrid event, and to thank the Ambassadors and their staff for their time and efforts in helping us to organise today's event. Of course, no remote solution can ever truly take the place of an in-person event, but we hope that the format today is considered good enough for now. We at DMA look forward to being able to welcome you all in person, internationally, as soon as is possible, and support all the efforts being made to vaccinate the world to allow for this to happen. There are one or two housekeeping notices that would be appropriate for me to mention at this point. This section of the event will run for about an hour and a half, after which, at 1.15 UK time and 12.15 Liberia time, we will switch to a live Zoom event, for which you will have received an invitation alongside your delegate information a few days ago. However, if you need to reference this at any time, it is also visible on the right-hand side of your screen on this platform. At this point, businesses in the UK and Liberia will introduce themselves on the Zoom call, after which those joining online will also be invited to introduce themselves, and finally the representatives of the Government of Liberia will introduce themselves. We will, of course, remind you of these various technicalities at the end of this section of the event. This will really be the most important section of today's event, and our job at DMA is to make this as easy as possible by facilitating meeting requests and questions to speakers. If you wish to meet any of the speakers, or wish to start a dialogue with any of the participants, please send these requests through your Global Meet registration, which you received in your delegate introduction email a few days ago, or email these requests to events at developingmarkets.com. If you wish your question to remain private, please do indicate this in your email or Global Meet request. While the pandemic has raged around us these past 18 months, the diplomatic services of the world have been busy negotiating and debating in advance of COP26 in Glasgow next month. And although we are all, of course, hopeful for a successful resolution to these negotiations, as well as a globally supported agreement, the efforts of businesses around the world to address the impact of climate change will remain as important after COP26 as they are now. It has never been more apparent that we must actively support energy transition throughout the developed and developing world to allow for economic development to come hand in hand with environmental protection. And in that spirit, I am delighted to introduce our host here in London today, the Liberian Ambassador to the United Kingdom, Her Excellency Ambassador Gibson Schwartz, to open today's event. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of His Excellency President George Manewia, the government and people of Liberia, and my embassy staff, I am pleased to welcome you to this UK Liberia Energy Transition Countdown event. This trade mission to Liberia will offer significant opportunities for investors to survey Liberia's ambitious renewable energy program, showing how the country is transitioning towards new and improved methods ahead of COP26 summit, which is taking place from the 1st to the 12th of November in Glasgow. With the December 2019 UK Liberia Business Conference held in London being the precursor to this energy event, the current British Ambassador to Liberia, His Excellency Neil Bradley, along with the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, has done a remarkable job in continuing our strong collaboration in holding this event. The cooperation among Liberia and UK government institutions to increase foreign direct investment in Liberia is in furtherance of the cordial and long-standing diplomatic relationship between our two countries, which spans over 150 years. Through time, the UK has remained a reliable development partner to Liberia, providing bilateral assistance in trade and aid, among other initiatives. As of today, President Weir's widely supported Popo agenda is an initiative to ensure a peaceful society instill accountability in the public sector 
while rebuilding core functions, institutions, and infrastructure. This administration is encouraging sustainable investments in Liberia's productive sectors to expand economic activities, spur job growth, and improve the standard of living of the Liberian people through education, health, youth development, and social protection. With a determined focus and turn off robust policies, Liberia's medium-term growth prospects has improved as our government continues to streamline processes and reduce bureaucratic bottlenecks while implementing several macroeconomic stabilization and structural reform initiatives. With foreign direct investment in sectors to include energy, agriculture, forestry, transportation, natural resources, and construction. Our government understands that the growth of the private sector supported by foreign direct investment is the cornerstone of the development of our economy and country strategy. I thank you for participating in this event. And with our great wealth of natural resources, including iron ore, rubber, diamond, gold, and timber, with an educated workforce and with a supportive government, I trust that you will agree that Liberia is open more importantly, ready for business. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. We now head to Monrovia for the opening remarks of Her Majesty's Ambassador to Liberia, Mr. Neil Bradley. Your Excellencies, Lord Sheikh, Honourable Ministers, distinguished guests, I'm delighted to be with you all at today's exciting event. I'd like to say a particular thank you to Developing Markets Associates for organising uh, our coming together today and to acknowledge the expertise and leadership on this important topic. Looking at our program for today, it's great to see such breadth of engagement from senior members of the government, which underscores the importance and cross-cutting nature of tackling climate change. I personally, in my role as the British Ambassador in Liberia, have appreciated the many fruitful discussions that I have had with many of those here from the Liberian government today. The UK welcomes your commitment to tackling climate change and with the presence of all the ministries and agencies involved in the renewable energy agenda, this event is an important step in bringing together actors across the whole renewable energy landscape. I want to begin by acknowledging the significant milestone that COP26 will present for a transition to a sustainable future. All countries are expected to go further on their nationally determined contributions against the temperature goals that were agreed in 2015. So I'd like to congratulate Liberia on submitting its revised NDC in good time and on its ambition of reducing economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions by 64% below the projected business as usual level and doing so by 2030. A crucial part of that is going to be the development of more solar and hydropower plants. However, as the recent NDC synthesis report shows, the overall impact of the plans submitted so far lags well behind what is needed to meet the Paris targets and avert the most disastrous effects of climate change. It's clear that the challenge we face can only be solved by collaboration between all actors and significantly between governments and the private sector. Therefore, the revised NDCs, long-term strategies and economic recovery plans need to support the whole economy transformation. Strong public policy commitments to low carbon solutions help create a favourable business and therefore investment environment. By turning the Paris commitments into concrete actions, countries will provide certainty to the market and help spur private investment. Crucially, energy transition is the most significant opportunity to attract private investment. As the cost of renewables and other low carbon technologies continue to fall, it is essential that countries and businesses seize the opportunity. 
Since 2010, the cost of solar power has fallen by 85%, and the cost of hydroelectric power has remained low. Liberia has high domestic potential for developing solar and hydroelectric energy, and such development is crucial to enable the badly needed expansion of access to electricity, particularly in rural areas. As part of that, we need to improve its affordability, given that the electricity tariff in Liberia is currently amongst the highest in the world. As the cost of renewable technology has fallen, global trade in low carbon goods and services has been accelerating. It is expected to grow from 150 British pounds in 2015 to up to 5 trillion pounds in 2050. It is now clear that transition to net zero is creating the greatest commercial opportunity of our age. Working together, we can also make greater progress on clean energy innovation. Half of the emissions reductions needed to meet the Paris Agreement rely on technologies that are not yet available. We can develop solutions faster, increase economies of scale, and bring down costs quicker. Now, the UK wants to use our presidency of COP26 to bring countries, states, industry, and businesses together to achieve this goal. And as I said earlier, achieving net zero requires a whole economy transformation. To deliver the Paris Agreement and achieve global net zero, the whole economic system needs to have transitioned by 2050, at the very latest. Every company, every bank, every insurer, every investor will have to adjust their business models develop credible plans for the transition and, crucially, implement them. We therefore need the private sector to join governments and state-owned enterprises in delivering on this ambition. To help underpin this, the UK wants to use our COP presidency to encourage countries to take the regulatory measures to manage climate-related financial risks. These measures can help businesses and communities better understand and prepare for potential financial impacts of climate change. Cooperation and collaboration is what is needed to reach ambitious goals and combat global warming together. And today's event is a brilliant example of what we can achieve in partnership. Thank you and I wish you a fruitful discussion today. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I am delighted now to introduce Lord Sheikh, a long-standing friend of DMA and a noted champion of ethical investment across the African continent. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good day to you all. Liberia is a country with a deep history. When I was a boy, I learned about Liberia in school and have had a genuine interest in the country ever since. It's fair to say that in more recent years, Liberia has experienced profound adversity. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Liberia had to contend with Ebola and notable civil unrest. However, I firmly believe that a difficult past should not obstruct a promising future. We must look forward to the future. Indeed, Liberia is richly endowed with water, mineral resources, forest, and a climate favorable to agriculture. Liberia is also the first and oldest republic in Africa and the first country in Africa to sit on the United Nations Security Council. In 1981, the Monrovia Group was established and it was a block of moderate African countries. This subsequently led to the formation of the Organization of 
African unity. I'm very much involved in promoting more trade between UK and overseas countries. I hope that we can work with Liberia together to accelerate more trade for benefit of both the countries. So although the United Kingdom's trade with Liberia has unfortunately diminished as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, this is not true of Liberia's values. I hope we can move forward now. COP26 represents an opportunity to promote a meaningful and lastful relationship between the United Kingdom and Liberia. By working together, our two countries could strengthen the bilateral green landscape. It is the essence of COP26 and the most pressing strategic challenge of our age. As I said in my maiden speech in the House of Lords several years ago, the environment is a passion of mine. I was brought up in Uganda and as a young boy would fish on the shores of Lake Victoria and swim in the clean waters of the River Nile. I saw green vegetation around me and wildlife in its natural habitat. I was lucky enough to enjoy nature in my youth and those experiences led me to a lifelong love of the environment. Tragically, we are now faced with the, degre with the degradation of this beautiful world. This cannot be allowed to happen. Now is the time to take proactive steps and ensure our planet's sustainable future. Tackling the climate crisis must be a national and international priority, especially as we recover from the pandemic and build back better and greener world. Although I was born and brought up in East Africa, I have not yet been to Liberia. However, as an African, I would like to I would like to see the whole continent to progress and commit to a sustainable future. With that in mind, I would like to applaud the work of Atom Sandu and the developing Marcus Associates for arranging this high-level event for Liberia. The lineup is undoubtedly first class and we have with us an outstanding collection of ministers, agencies, regulators and companies. Shortly, you will also hear from the World Bank and ministers and representatives from the government of Liberia. Indeed, this is an official COP26 event and the, assembled com and the assembled company here with us should remind us of that fact. I'm a businessman and have been the chairman and chief executive of a successful public company. Therefore, I'm delighted to have with us today many British companies participating in these discussions. If we are all on the same page and coordinate our efforts accordingly, accordingly, then I'm sure we will be successful and achieve our goals. Liberia is a country with a potential to progress further in renewable energy sources. 
we must cultivate we must cultivate this to decarbonize the economy and restore our natural environment for the benefit of the world impact investing is a growing market which offers investors an opportunity to drive social and environmental progress with the prospect of encouraging financial returns through through impact investment we can build the necessary equipment to ensure liberia is at the forefront of the fight against climate change the sapo national park in liberia is of, is one of the largest areas of protected rainforest in west africa and liberia can be poised to become a leading light for others to follow i may add that i co-chair the all party parliamentary group on islamic finance and i suggest that islamic finance also be used to assist liberia in reaching its environmental targets islamic finance provides support to projects which help communities and can be another effective measure we can utilize to ensure liberia's transition to greener energy ultimately i believe liberia should one day become a cornerstone for any impact investment strategy the potential for renewable energy and wider benefits for surrounding areas make it a viable and worthwhile solution such per such purposeful financing will underpin our efforts as we look to recover from covid-19 and win the war against climate change i very much hope that we all have interesting and productive discussions today thank you very much thank you lord shaik for the first keynote speech of today's event i am delighted now to introduce you to mr d maxwell kamaya senior his excellency the minister of foreign affairs from the liberian government officials of the governments of great britain and the republic of liberia business leaders potential investors participants distinguished ladies and gentlemen I bring you greetings on behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Liberia, His Excellency Ambassador D. Maxwell Sarkimaya Sr., who, as a business person himself, would have loved to be able to make these remarks at this auspicious occasion, but is presently on a plane back to Liberia. He sends his warmest greetings and looks forward to future engagements with some of you at the COP26 scheduled for early November in Glasgow. On behalf of His Excellency Dr. George Manawir, President of the Republic of Liberia, the government and people of the Republic of Liberia, we want to thank you immensely for participating in this great initiative, which we hope is only the first step in your journeys towards investing in Liberia's ambitious renewable energy program. As you can see, our government and nation are accessible and ready to ensure that you are a success in your business endeavors here in our beautiful and emerging country of Liberia. Not only are we prepared for investment in a variety of sectors, but renewable energy stands at the top of our efforts because we as a government understand that climate change is real and that we must adapt to the changing realities of doing business in our modern and interconnected world. As our colleagues have made this case, Liberia is endowed with natural resources and thousands of well-skilled and educated workers prepared to help you in growing your business. Furthermore, and like the rest of the world, we are committed to ensuring that with the partnership of investors, multilateral and bilateral partners 
such as the United Kingdom, all working collectively to achieve long-term and sustainable growth, we will not only build back stronger, but we will also build back smarter. We thank you once again for considering Liberia a truly undiscovered and logical destination for your growing business interests. And we hope to see you very soon in the Republic of Liberia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. To speak on the crucial subject of diversifying Liberia's energy mix, I'm pleased to introduce you to Mr. Gessler Murray, the Honourable Minister of Lands, Mines and Energy from the Government of Liberia. Ambassadors, uh, Lord Sheikh, Honourable Ministers and distinguished guests. We do indeed live in challenging times and the last two years and all that the COVID pandemic has brought upon us has indeed been challenging. So I'm delighted that we are gathering today, albeit virtually, for this UK Liberia Investment Conference. I think we can all acknowledge that this virtual medium is not quite as attractive, I believe, as the last UK Liberia Investment Conference that was held in St. James in London in 2018. But in terms of perseverance in the face of adversity, I believe we are holding our own. So thank you all for joining us. I also want to thank GMA and Mr. Adam Sandu for organizing today's event. And I would especially like to thank the British Ambassador here in Morovia, His Excellency Neil Brackley, and Her Excellency Gurley Gibson Schwartz, our esteemed ambassador in London. Welcome to all of you and thank you for participating. Liberia offers excellent investment opportunities across all sectors. And as His Excellency the President has often said, we are open for business. But today, as we approach the COP26 in Glasgow next month, the focus is on renewable energy. The Liberian energy sector is a challenging environment, but it is also a sector of great opportunity. We have grown from 400 connections and a few megawatts of diesel generation in 2005 to 88 megawatts of installed hydro capacity at Mount Coffee and 38 megawatts of HFO generation. A total of 126 megawatts, serving 107,000 connections as of the day. Our peak load has more than doubled since 2018, and we expect to reach 55 megawatts also by year end. That expansion of our demand in itself is exponential growth, but having committed to a very ambitious universal access to, ele to electricity in Liberia by 2030. We have much further to go. Indeed, over the last, over the next two years, our existing donor-funded projects, courtesy of World Bank, the European Union, the African Development Bank, and our German friends in KFW, we plan to connect a further 160,000 households and commercial premises to the grid. In parallel with these existing projects, we are also adopting a strategy on a reading by the latest World Bank branch of funding to strengthen the existing grid and to densify connections in single quotes. We need to densify the connections along our lines and projects in order to reduce the damage that power theft does to both the infrastructure and the furnaces 
of the sector and the country as a whole. There can be no ignoring the impact of power theft on our sector and tariff. But we are but we are now starting to impact on it. Indeed, over the last twelve months, we have reduced it by nearly four percent, and we intend to continue that downward trajectory. So this growth of commercial and domestic connections will massively increase our demand for power. We expect to outstrip our wet season generation at the Mount Coffee Hydro Power Plant by the end of next year. Of course, we also have the 225 kVA uh, CLSG interconnector lines that now clock Liberia into the west, into the wider West African power pool. And we will have to rely on the on, on that for our dry season generation gap until we can develop further solar and hydro power assets. And that's where we hope to develop the relationship with those attending this conference. Since His Excellency the President took office, it has been our objective to become a regional hub for renewable energy generation. And we have good solar potential to augment the reduced dry season, dry season hydro, hydro generation. Unfortunately, we are currently tied to our 28 megawatts of HFO fossil fuel generation during the dry season. But in light of the realities of climate change, we have resisted expanding that fossil fuel capacity. We firmly see the solution to both our growing domestic, commercial, and mining demand, and the parallel dry season generation gap as an increase in renewable generation. And that's where we need responsible and transparent investment. We believe that this is not only good for Liberia, but also the best economic solution and the best environmental solution for our children. So with that in mind, I'll, I will now hand over to my team to present our least cost development plan for renewable generation. Uh, firstly, the St. Paul's Second Hydra and Solar Project does actually have a Liberian focal team, uh, and that's chaired by Assistant Minister of Energy, William Thompson, but unfortunately, he can't be here for this recording, so uh, the ministers asked me to step in, which, of course, I am I am delighted to do. So, just to give some context, over the last decade, more than $30 billion has been spent on renewables in Africa, and there's huge uh, outstanding potential on the continent. Now, Liberia is no exception, and it possesses both some very large rivers and also viable commercial solar. Uh, background to this, this project. Well, this project started quite some time ago with the long-held vision of a large Via reservoir at the confluence of the Spall and the Via River up in the north of the country. Uh, there were several studies done in the 70s, the largest being the Chastity Main studies, and really they identified 12 potential hydro cascade sites that were looked at. Um, it made use of the St. Paul's catchment area, a sizable catchment area, um, and this is really what it came up with. Note the Via Reservoir in the top right-hand corner of the screen and the little yellow pin showing the existing Mount Coffee uh, hydropower in the bottom um, uh, left-hand corner and the St. Paul's too roughly in the middle. That shows the cross section, which shows the, uh, um, the drop from Via down to Mount Coffee, um, puts it in, in context a little bit. Um, so what resuscitated this project? Well, largely it was a few years ago, we sat down and we looked at the CLSG. And of course the CLSG line, the 225 kV West African Power Pool interconnector, plugs Liberia and, of course, Sierra Leone into the West African Purple. 
Um, that's a lot of investment that's already been done under someone else's bank book. Uh, and it will allow large flows of power both for regional export and regional movement, but also internally in, in the country. So in other words, someone else is paying for the route to market and the, route, the ability to move these chunks of energy around. Um, we also looked at the huge projected growth demand forecast. <laughs> and there have been lots of studies on this. I think a lot of them are still too low, um, knowing and loving Liberia side two and seeing what's going on here. Um, but whichever one you look at, the trajectory is obvious. It's, it's significantly upwards. And if you add in that the influence of mining uh, projects, it's, it's even greater. The idea was to identify priority investment projects that could meet the demand over up to 2020-30, as you see here. Um, and so in 2019, with West African Powerpoint World Bank funding, we moved on to an optimization study. Um, and this was very interesting because it in effect turned the Via Reservoir concept on its head, but in a good way. Uh, it identified that the Via Reservoir and the Cascades were way too expensive in the current economic climate uh, to do it in one go, vastly too expensive than that which could be afforded. It also identified some fairly significant environmental concerns with the size of the Via Reservoir, uh, et cetera. So what we started to do was they looked at, rather than going from Via down to Mount Coffee, going from Mount Coffee up and looking at the next cascade that we could, uh, that was commercially viable to put in place. And we came up with three priority investment projects. The first one being a second hydropower plant on the St. Paul River, an extension at the existing Mount Coffee uh, power plant using uh, the, the spare penstocks and up to 90 megawatts of utility scale solar at up to three sites. And the cost rankings, now again, I do stress this is, this is dated now, 2019, and it needs to be updated. But as you can see along the bottom, it does identify some commercially interesting options there on those three priority investment projects. I do stress this needs to be updated. So the current situation, well, we've got a full environmentally compliant and bankable feasibility study going on on each one of those three uh, PIPs. Consultants are on site and we've recruited a strategic um, transaction advisor who's looking at the commercial modeling, um, et cetera, and the funding. Uh, a reduction in commercial losses remains top of the LEC and the GOL priority list, the government of Liberia priority list, and movement is being made on that, which is very good news. And the CLSG Energy Highway, as we've discussed, allows the movement of large chunks of power. So the first priority investment project we looked at, St. Paul's 2, uh, 150 megawatts. And uh, as I said, that is, that is just, just gives you the footprint. Again, it's been updated, but it gives you an idea of the footprint. Um, sorry, I'm just going to have to go back. There we go. Um, we are now at a point where we're going to have to decide on the two options for the St. Paul's 2. Uh, it's either 107 megawatt option or 150 megawatt option with some storage. And that's wet season generation uh, and installed capacity. Uh, dry season would be about 19 megawatts and 34 megawatts respectively. And dry season storage, dry season generation is extremely important in that area. Uh, with the 150 megawatt option, there would be some dry season benefit at Mount Coffee, um, which is good. Any dry season generation you can get in West Africa is extremely good. Uh, but it's not massive, but it is, you know, it's, it's very worthwhile. Uh, and we would also require on-site solar, again, to cover that dry season generation gap. For both of them, the LCOEs, the uh, cost of energy looks very good. They're both commercially viable. They're both coming up with good figures. We've done, we started doing the seismic work and the geotech will follow shortly. And to enable that geotech, we are constructing a temporary access road, which is uh, work ongoing at the moment. There are no environmental red lines as yet, but again, the environmental studies are ongoing. And uh, we obviously work with the Environmental Protection Agency and Professor uh, Wilson Tarpe uh, very closely on that. Uh, and the resettlement for both these options is in acceptable ranges. Uh, the investment studies, well, yeah, they're ongoing with the strategic transaction advisor, IPP, PPP. Well, 
In all honesty, I suspect it'll be a blended option, but that's the strategic transaction advisor's job. Uh, that's what they're paid for to come up with those options. Um, for the second priority investment project, the Mount Coffee 44 megawatt extension, uh, this is Mount Coffee as we started the rehabilitation. You can see the powerhouse there, um, completely gutted. But interesting, if you step back from that um, and look at the, uh, the red lozenge, you will note that uh, there are six sets of pen stocks, only four of which are utilized for Mount Coffee. And moving on to where we are now, um, you can see the refurbished powerhouse, but you can still see on the right-hand side in the red, red circle, the overlapping set of two extra uh, pen stocks. And we thought, how could we utilize those? Um, it's of note that any extra generation of Mount Coffee using those pen stocks would really only give you generation during the wet, the wet season. But that the figures coming in for that are significant. It's uh, it's a good price. It's a good cost, um, and it really looks at do we have uh, the market for extra wet season generation. So where are we? Feasibility studies ongoing. Obviously, there are advantages with the existing infrastructure. The environmental work's all done for Mount Coffee already a few years ago um, and still extant. Uh, Mount Coffee's operating, so there are operators there and there's a structure there. And obviously, you have uh, access to both the LEC and the CLSG substations that are on the Mount Coffee footprint and a few hundred meters away. So all that uh, saves substantial money. Um, we have to look carefully at the engineering impact on the existing structure and the dam, and that's a focus for the feasibility study. And as I said, the commercial modeling really looks at wet season generation only, and the demand and potential offtakers, et cetera, would pro will probably dictate when this project uh, was brought online. We're also looking at if we can be slightly more clever. Uh, with the configuration of the turbines, and can we get a slightly more intelligent turbine in there that makes better use of low flow during the dry season? And obviously, the discussion is ongoing in the feasibility study, do we put in one turbine, two turbines, whatever. So all that's being looked at. And this could be a potentially relatively quick uh, process, depending on the engineering. But as I said, full feasibility study ongoing as for the third priority investment project, it was 90 megawatts of solar across three utility scale sites. And uh, the work done uh, already on measuring the radiation in Liberia clearly shows there is a commercial model for it. But obviously, you need to get away from the coast uh, to make use of that. There are ongoing studies. Uh, ECOWAS and the World Bank are bringing in two more solar measuring stations um in the next month or so to complete this uh this picture or to expand this picture as it were and as a result we've selected the 20 megawatt pilot site at the mount Co existing mount coffee plant this really just gives some context to what we were looking at uh i think i can move on quite quickly from that so back to the 20 megawatt pilot site well the land is owned by lec which is good news um and there's an existing WAP measurement station that we've now got in place and has been operating for several months. The uh, solar radiance is good around Mount Coffee, and we've got donors that are considering support through various initiatives uh, and funding instruments. Full feasibility study is still ongoing with that, and we're aiming for a financial close in 2022. Now, I don't want to go into more detail on that because there will be a teaser out shortly for anyone that's interested. Uh, on this project. Uh, proximity to substations and transmission lines and infrastructure makes it attractive cost-wise. Um, as I said, the uh, substations um, are literally a few hundred meters away from the proposed site. And there's an existing construction camp and accommodation that's left over from the Mount Coffee rehabilitation project, uh, still in place, uh, still in good nick. There are no ESI red lines and no wrap, as you can imagine, because it's all on the Mount Coffee footprint and within the Mount Coffee estate. Um, and the options are being looked at for containerized solution. Uh, we also need to look at stories of storage options. Now, there are two other sites, and, and the areas we're looking at are St. Paul's 2, uh, the site of the hydro, and also probably at Buchanan, given the load that will come online there. Uh, and that's the extra 70 megawatts, but the timelines for that obviously will depend on demand growth on load and a number of other issues. 
what is clear is solar is going to be needed to cover the dry season generation gaps as we, as we look forward. And uh, last point I would make on this is please we ask any potential bidders not to focus on the existing tariffs uh, and don't use that for your financial modelling because you will hit rocks if you do that. So that tariff has to come down, as you heard from the minister earlier. So what next? Well, priority investment project one, decision pending on which option to go for at St. Paul's two. Full feasibility is ongoing and it has done through COVID-19. And I think that it bears testament to the robust and intelligent approach from the government of Liberia uh, and the minister and his ministry that we've managed to push this through. And WAP and World Bank obviously very supportive on this through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The Strategic Transactions Advisor is looking at the financial modelling and funding options as, as, as we talk. Um, for priority investment to the Mount Coffee extension, again, feasibility study ongoing. Uh, there is consideration being given as to when it might be best brought online. And the Strategic Transaction Advisor is looking at the funding and the potential of takers, et cetera. Uh, priority investment three, solar. This is the one probably closest to the canoe. Um, Mount Coffee 20 megawatt solar pilot site will be the first investment project. Um, and the dry season gap really is a defining factor in the sector in Liberia, as I'm sure you all know. Much more solar will be needed in due course, and we're going to need battery storage. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Ambassadors, uh, honoured guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We now have a session on the Liberian business offering with a special focus on environmental protection and economic development, with contributions from Ms. Jeannie Cooper, the Honourable Minister for Agriculture, Mr. Stephen Potter Sr., the Deputy Executive Director of the Rural and Renewable Energy Agency, Ms. Maween Diggs, the Honourable Minister for Commerce and Industry, Mr. Wilson Tarpe, the Honourable Executive Director and CEO for the Environmental Protection Agency, and Ms. Charlene Brumskin, Managing Partner of CMB Law Group. Thank you very much for joining us here today, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, my name is Janine Cooper, and I'm the Minister of Agriculture in Liberia, a lifelong farmer and agribusiness entrepreneur. Well, the agriculture sector in Liberia has long been um, the anchor of Liberia's economic development, and that's no less true now than it was 50 years ago when it was the prime mover of the economy. Um, Rubber is uh, a crop that we've exported uh, for more than a hundred years, but um, coffee, uh, palm oil, uh, those are also known export crops from the 19th century up until now. The sector right now is just at the cusp of industrializing. Um, uh, we have um, cassava, we have rubber, palm oil, um, cocoa, coffee, we have fisheries and aquaculture, shrimp farming, for example, uh, where we have a comparative advantage in producing um, those goods, we now need to take the next step to industrialize. Well, the agriculture sector in Liberia is poised to industrialize. And, and what does that mean? It sounds very big. Rubber, for example, the last year and a half has taught the world the value of items such as rubber gloves. There's no major rubber manufacturing um, uh, plant in Liberia, although we've been producing rubber here for 100 years. This is a sector that we can grab with very little effort and transform uh, the economy, create jobs uh, and grow. It's a huge investment opportunity uh, that's waiting for the, 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 the right um, uh, partner and, and catalyst. Um, cassava, cassava, we've got more than a million tons of cassava in the ground 
here in Liberia. We don't have a major cassava processing plant. So there are opportunities, um, cocoa, for example. Everybody knows now how cocoa, how important cocoa is and, and what a comfort uh, chocolate has been through the pandemic. Um, we have a growing and vibrant cocoa sector that's been targeting mainly commodity exports and now we're looking at transforming the economy through industrialization. Liberia holds close to 50% of the Upper Guinea forest in climate speak known as the third lung of the world after the Amazon and the Congo Basin. What does this mean? Our agroforestry sector will anchor our economic development because Liberia will at the same time be one of West Africa's most important carbon sinks and biodiversity hotspots. And that means our tree crops, such as rubber, such as cocoa, such as oil palm, such as coffee, those will be the ones which will at the same time as they are sequestering carbon, will be producing the products and um, uh, items that we need to transform our economy. Liberia holds close to 50% of the Upper Guinea forest and in climate speak the Upper Guinea forest is also known as the third lung of the world after the Amazon and the Congo uh, uh, basin. Those trees have a value Liberia's contribution to greenhouse gas sequestration that means we are a net holder of um, close to 80 million metric tons of greenhouse gases every year in this country. So agroforestry is a sector that is really, really set to grow as we try to conserve our patrimony in, in um, our forest cover um, and um, expand our socioeconomic development based on what we do. Liberia is West Africa's, probably West, West Africa's most important carbon sink and biodiversity hotspot. And it starts with our trees, of which we have many. The Liberian agriculture sector is, is poised to take off. The transformation of our economy will be anchored in agriculture. We're so excited about the opportunities that we have in rubber. For example, with the pandemic, what could we be contributing with our rubber? Uh, rubber gloves manufacturing, tire retreading uh, factories, all of these are possible with very little um, uh, investment capital and a little bit of will the trees are here. Cocoa transforming Liberia into a, a, a source of premium certified organic cocoa because 90%, 95% of what we grow here is grown organic, organically without pesticides, without chemicals, without uh, harmful fertilizers. So we're looking to target quality rather than mass production. And um, we have all of the sectors ready to go. We invite you to come and take a look at Liberian agriculture. Greetings, I'm Awani G. Diggs, Minister of Commerce and Industry of the Republic of Liberia. As a regulator of commerce and free trade in the Republic of Liberia, the Ministry of Commerce and Industry is excited to add its voice to many others as we count down to COP26. In the midst of the disruptions resulting from COVID-19 and other global economic challenges, I am excited to note that trade and investment continues to present the best opportunity for economic growth. The Liberian economy faces numerous long-standing constraints to economic growth, including weak transport infrastructure, unreliable utilities, and inefficiency in bureaucracy. However, the country as a whole does offer certain comparative advantages. Opportunities exist for import substitution and export promotion, 
for select industries with agro processing, packaging, and limited manufacturing activities, all realistic possibilities for investment. Based on existing resources and enterprises, as well as local, regional, and global market demand, trade and commerce remains the strongest candidate for industries to include food processing for fisheries and palm oil, additional processing and manufacturing of wood products, and packaging and labeling for various imported and exported products. The need for foreign direct investment cannot be overemphasized as it is an important tool for development and a means for increasing available capital for economic growth and the investment needed to support the government of Liberia's pro poor agenda. It will also provide employment opportunities, increase skills, and raise the living standards for Liberians. Most of our current foreign direct investment are in the extractive sector. However, we must now focus on agriculture, agro-processing, and manufacturing to secure Liberia's future. Agriculture, industrial, and service sectors are building blocks of trade in Liberia, offering huge employment opportunities for our citizens. The Liberian government has placed investment in agriculture as a top priority due to its value addition and manufacturing along the value chain. To further enhance this objective and encourage foreign direct investment, the government of Liberia enacted the Special Economic Zone to respond to the challenges faced by both foreign and domestic investors. This is a mechanism which is intended to designate physical areas such as land in which businesses and trade laws will differ from the rest of the country in order to stimulate increased trade. Job creation, effective administration, these are all overall goals so that we create a world-class business environment that is predictable, productive, and profitable. The government of Liberia is now focused on the construction of the special economic zone to develop Liberia's competitive advantage in agriculture and transshipment, while maximizing the inclusion of smallholder and SME producers into larger value chains. This will lead to the creation of thousands of jobs for our citizens and at the same time continuously develop the agricultural sector, strengthen our exports and our local economy. The government of Liberia has designated Buchanan City, Grand Bassa County as the location for the construction of the special economic zone and has also secured 200 hectares of land for such purpose. The city of Buchanan has an existing port and supporting infrastructure. The Port of Buchanan is currently underutilized and could offer an alternative to the overcrowded Freeport of Monrovia, particularly for goods originating in or destined for rural parts of our country. Potential access to the Nimba Railway and proximity to the new Transco CLSG power substation, which is currently in operation, will further enhance the access that this special economic zone creates. Additionally, as part of our WTO Ascension Plan, we are currently working to establish a national single window platform with the objective of improving trade facilitation, increasing domestic resource mobilization, reducing time and documentation needed for import and export. The national single window will be a multi-agency platform which will offer both foreign and domestic businesses and individual access to resources and standardized services across government. It will also allow users to gather trade information online, submit trade documents, and track its progress in real time. Make payments through various e-payment platforms and contact help desks to report any difficulties and challenges encountered while carrying out import and export like activities in Liberia. The National Single Window will be valuable in our efforts to improve trade facilitation and create a business environment worthy of your investment. With all of these measures in place and a demonstration of strong political will, the right business environment will be created to have a friendlier investment climate. I want to use this occasion to reiterate the call by our president, His Excellency Dr. George Manawie, that Liberia is open for business and a destination for your investment. As we prepare to operate within this post-COVID era, we must begin forming the right partnerships, and attracting genuine investment to meet the growing needs of our people and improve economic outlook. 
Therefore, Liberia remains committed to creating jobs for our youthful population, developing our infrastructure, and growing our economy. We welcome you to join us in this journey and be a part of what Liberia has to offer. Thank you. Okay, welcome uh, Rodai to the Rural and Renewable Energy Agency, an agency of the government of Liberia. My name is Stephen V. Post Senior. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Programs. The Rural and Renewable Energy Agency is an agency of the government of Liberia established in 2010 with the mandate to facilitate and accelerate the economic transformation of rural Liberia by promoting the development and supply of energy products and services to the rural part of Liberia. And this we have been doing over time. Uh, we managed to develop our strategic, strategic roadmap, which we refer to as the Rural Energy Strategy and Master Plan. And that master plan intends to electrify about 265,000 homes by 2030 or 1.3 million uh, persons across the rural part of Liberia. Uh, we have identified 21 initiatives and 92 projects. We hope uh, that uh, most of our energy production will come from indigenous renewable energy resources. Uh, by 2030, we hope to have an installed capacity of about 150 megawatts of renewable energy re uh, within our mix, uh, within our energy mix uh, across uh, rural Liberia. Uh, we are very grateful to our development partners, uh, in particular the World Bank, the, uh, the African Development Bank, the European Union, the government of Sweden, uh, the government of Sweden, uh, other uh, stakeholders, including the, the government of uh, the United States they have been very productive, uh, very supportive of uh, our efforts here. Uh, currently, as we speak, we have a, a portfolio in excess of about 125 million uh, supported by our, our development partners. We are currently uh, implementing a project in Lofa County funded by the World Bank uh, in the tune of uh, 27 million that is called the Liberia Renewable Energy Assets Project. And that project is going to uh, uh, develop a 2.5 megawatt hydropower plant that will cater for about 50,000 persons uh, within Lofa County, covering from uh, Fonchima to uh, Foya, going through Kolahon and all of the uh, communities and towns along the corridor. Also, with the African Development Bank, we have a 33.4 million dollars, 74 million dollars uh, project. Uh, we intend to uh, build a, another hydropower plant. Uh, there is a waterfall somewhere between Kanta towards Sunny uh, It's called a Wading Fall. And on that fall, we're going to build a hydropower plant that will have a capacity of 9.34 megawatt. And that will be uh, deposited onto the uh, CLSG, CLSG substation in Yekipa to allow for um, the spread of the energy to other parts of the country. Uh, with support from uh, the European Union, we are receiving 42 million euros in grant funding to uh, do uh, a number of projects, including uh, the electrification of Picano City and its environs. Uh, we are also going to be uh, electrifying Greenville with a 2 megawatt of hydropower plant. Uh, initially, we hope to do a 600 kilowatt peak of uh, solar in Greenville and that will cater for the entire population of Greenville and its environs. We have also received uh, a, a concessional loan from the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development and we're going to be developing uh, a 2.13 megawatt hydropower plant on the River G somewhere between Plebo and Fish Town and that will be our main, our main source of uh, energy generation for the people of Fish Fish Town and Plebo, and currently we are recruiting the uh, owner's engineer for that project. For the project in Lofa, uh, the contractors are already 
doing their best to get the hydro power plant installed. Uh, for the project at the waiting for, we we have a number of contracts already signed and uh, works are ongoing. Um, in the sound of County Greenville, we are doing some last minute studies to get the ball rolling in terms of uh, construction. Uh, here at the RRE, we are committed to ensuring that uh, with between now and 2030, uh, we will have about 1.34 million persons within rural Liberia have access to electricity. And that is why we are committed to it. And we are very thankful to the government for its support to the Rural Renewable Energy Agency. Thank you. My name is Wilson Tarpe. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Environmental Protection Program of Liberia. And I'm glad to be here. And thank you guys for this um, occasion. Uh, on the issue of climate change, Liberia has taken a number of important uh, initiatives as far back as uh, 2003. Uh, you are aware that the Paris Agreement came into force in uh, 2015, Liberia rectified it in 2018. But before that and during that period, we have had, we have taken some important uh, steps in terms of the uh, climate change actions. Several policy documents have been put in place. First is our climate change strategy, the gender action plan, the interim national, uh, 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 determinate, uh, uh, nationally determined contribution and recently we completed the first uh, quantified uh, nationally determined contribution of Liberia which was approved, submitted to the UN in July and approved in, in August. So we are on our way. In that document, we, we, we capture four important things when it comes to the issue of energy. And that refers to reduce the greenhouse gas emission by 40.6% and, um, and below what we call the business as usual level. The second thing is to reconnect Monrovia um, to the main power grid, connect clients to the main power grid. And as you know, the power coming from I mean, the distributed through that is coming from the hydro. So the use of hydro reduces the emission of, of, of greenhouse gas. Uh, although we, 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 we use sometimes we use gas turbines, which 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 produce that. We want to be able to minimize that. The third thing there also is to develop off-grade small hydro. Those are uh, clients that are not on the high grade you do independent hydro around the country and I think this is something that we are looking at. Why are we interested in that? We are interested in that because that's clean power. It doesn't emit greenhouse gas. If it does, it's, it's completely minimized. And the next is to, um, uh, to, to develop and distribute the use of gas stoves. We call them uh, eco gas stoves, uh, eco stoves. Those are stoves that are used our, our, our uh, uh, our market women, our fish trawlers to dry fish. And once we can get that done, it can, it can produce significant uh, uh, benefit both for our people and, 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 and for the environment. Because the gas health emission uh, 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 risk of that is extremely low. So those are the four major things. I can also tell you that in the last year, we have made significant strides to raise the issue of the climate change to the national platform. Um, in January, I mean in June, the president was 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 the convener of the uh, the climate the national conference on climate climate change and environment, the first of its kind anywhere in the subregion. That raised the issue of the climate change to that level. The intent is to make sure the national development plan, which is the PAPD, we make sure that we make it green as much as possible. And that's what we've been able to do. As we speak, the NDC has been approved and we are gearing out to go to one of the, in fact, the largest gathering of world leaders and uh, of, of people involved in the climate change uh, regime. We, there's a major gathering that's going to be held in Glasgow, the United Kingdom, in about a month. And we expect to go there. We've made significant contributions. We've made con significant uh, uh, efforts to move Liberia uh, uh, along the path to ensure that um, those 
conditions, those uh, uh, benchmarks that were established uh, for, for the, the reduction of greenhouse gas, uh, uh, the measures have been observed. And finally, I will tell you that you know uh, when it comes to the climate resilient efforts, uh, the first we did was Bicana, and then we did uh, Nicu Town, which is a detour. Uh, in our we will be launching uh, the 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 West Point the part, which is the Monrovia Metropolitan uh, uh, Climate Resilient Project. It's a twenty five million dollar project in which the, 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 the Green Climate Fund is contributing about 17.2 million. The rest is the government of Liberia and the United Nations Development Program. So you can see all of these efforts are geared towards ensuring that the environment, climate change, we adopt, we, we put in place uh, what we call adaptations and mitigation measures and resilient measures to make sure that we are able to cope with the environment, we are able to cope with the changes in the climate, to make sure our people are okay and in the process ensure that the benefit of that can accrue to economic development. Thank you. Hello, I'm Charlene Brumskin. I am an attorney and the managing partner of CMB Law Group. Okay. So I know you've heard so many times that Liberia is open for business, but I'm here to tell you that Liberia truly is open for business. As um, the founding attorney and managing partner of CMB Law Group, one of the fastest growing law firms in Liberia, and as a professor of legal writing and research at the Louis Arthur Brown School of Law, I can tell you that the legal community is evolving, it's growing, and it's being strengthened. In the past 15 years, about $16 billion has been invested in Liberia through foreign direct investment. And do you know why that is? It's because we have provided protection for your investment. Liberian lawyers have ensured that ethics, integrity, a sound grasp of the law is meant to protect your investment. The Liberian Commercial Code has continued to evolve to make sure that foreign investors are protected. What does that mean? It means that the commercial code allows for foreign judgments to be enforced here in Liberia. It means that the commercial code, commercial codes, excuse me, has created a commercial court that creates a one-stop shop for financial, um, corporate, contractual, transactional uh, judgments and cases to be heard. This expedites these commercial activities in Liberia. We have an arbitration um, regime that allows for, as I said, foreign um, judgments to be enforced here, for arbitration to be heard at the ICC. Liberia is a member of the Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes between states and nationals of other states, ICSID, and that's meant to protect you. We are evolving. I'm proud to say that Liberia has recently revised its bankruptcy regime. We now have a new insolvency um, code that protects investors, that protects businesses, that protects uh, commerce here in Liberia. We are growing. Why Liberia? Why not Liberia? Liberia, particularly with relations with the UK, Liberia's common law, our legal jurisprudence, is based on the common law structure of the United Kingdom. Liberia borrows many of its common law, of its case law, from that, and, and some statutory language from that of Delaware and New York. We have a legal economy that is based on some of the most robust commercial jurisdictions in the world. We are here to protect you. Another reason that Liberia really is ripe for commercial investment is because despite what we see and hear, there are so many similarities between Liberia and the UK. Let me give you an example. I know so many law students and practicing lawyers who have received their legal education in the UK. They have learned about your culture, they have learned about your legal system. They've brought that back here, not to necessarily change our culture, but to influence how we do business and how we practice law. Isn't that reason enough to come here?
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your valuable insights and for joining us today. For the final speech of the day, I am now pleased to introduce the World Bank's country manager for Liberia, Mr. Kwima Nathara, to talk about financing energy transition and investing to achieve net zero. Hello, distinguished speakers, guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great privilege and honor for me to speak on this auspicious occasion, presenting before the global business community some of the exciting opportunities that the energy sector in Liberia has to offer. Liberia is endowed with many natural resources such as iron ore, rubber, just to mention a few. The proper utilization of these natural resources can contribute significantly to rapid economic growth and development in the country. However, the mining concessions currently rely on expensive diesel generators for electricity supply. Therefore, the provision of cheaper, reliable, and more environmentally sustainable sources of electricity can bring about a transformational change in the economy. The World Bank has been a long-standing partner of the government of Liberia to address the constraints the country is facing, including in energy infrastructure. Addressing these infrastructure bottlenecks is crucial to fostering economic growth and development. Developing the needed infrastructure, including in the energy sector, will require mobilizing private investments, and the World Bank is supporting government efforts to create an enabling environment for mobilizing private investment in the energy sector. The World Bank support to the Liberia energy sector comprises a comprehensive suite of investment financing for grid and off-grid electricity access, regional integration, and through direct budget support that is used to incentivize the implementation of critical policy and decision reforms in the sector. Our most recent investment financing to the energy sector includes a multi-phase programmatic approach with the first phase focusing on grid extension and intensification, as well as piloting of renewable energy off-grid based solutions through the private sector, while supporting the institutional strengthening of the National Electricity Utility Company, which is called the Liberia Electricity Corporation or LEC. We are also supporting jointly with the German KFW and the African Development Bank, the Côte d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea interconnection which is expected to be operational by year end, allowing Liberia to tap into regional hydropower sources to complement its own generation and Mount Coffee generation uh, plant, particularly during the dry season. The CLSG also offers an opportunity for Liberia to export its excess power during the wet season to the regional market. Recognizing that the current installed capacity of Liberia is inadequate to meet the needs, we have supported the government of Liberia in developing a least cost generation expansion plan. The optimization study, as it is referred to, has been particularly cognizant of the climate change goals of the country and have developed a green and sustainable pathway for Liberia to meet its future energy needs. The optimization study has shown that by utilizing the hydro and solar sources of the country, Liberia can meet its future energy needs from green and renewable energy sources, thus embarking on an environmentally sustainable pathway for energy generation, allowing it to meet its, nat its nationally determined goals. The optimization study has identified three major generation projects needed for meeting the country's needs in the medium to long term, which would require almost a billion dollar investment in the next 10 years. The three projects are as follows. Firstly, the 150 megawatt hydropower development on the St. Paul River. Secondly, the extension of Mount Coffee for 44 megawatt additional capacity. And finally, 90 megawatts of grid connected solar to be developed in phases. Leveraging private sector investment will be critical for these projects to materialize. Preparation of the first phase of the grid connected solar for a 20 megawatt plant at the existing site of Mount Coffee is currently ongoing with transaction advisor support from the World Bank funded West Africa Power Pool Plan grant. As part of preparation of the competitive tendering, the transaction advisors reaching out to various stakeholders, including the private sector, to structure a transaction that would be financially viable for the private sector and affordable to the government of Liberia. The detailed feasibility study for the 150 megawatt hydropower station at St. Paul River is ongoing as well as with support from the WAPP grant. 
we are aware of the critical importance of a credit worthy of taker for private investment in these generation projects to materialize. Efforts are underway to improve the operational and financial performance of the national utility, the LEC. However, in order to help reduce any perceived risks, we will try our best from the World Bank Group to bring in the necessary guarantee instruments subject to agreement with the government on the right enabling conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, with the current state of electricity access and the slow pace of electrification, achieving universal access to electricity in Liberia within a reasonable time frame will require coordinated efforts in both grid and off-grid options. A national electrification strategy has now been developed by the government with funding support from the World Bank that has provided for a pathway to achieve universal access to electricity by 2030. Based on geospatial analysis of clustering of households and other load centers, the strategy provides a roadmap for access, access expansion through a combination of expansion and densification of the LEC grid infrastructure, expansion of the distribution network along the CLSG corridor, expansion of cross-border systems, development of large and single community mini grids, and a significant scale up of standalone solar solutions. Beyond significant public investments, the strategy estimates that about $140 million of private investment will be needed in off-grid solutions for large and single community mini-grids and standalone solar solutions to achieve the goal of universal access to electricity by 2030. The World Bank, in coordination with other development partners, is supporting the government in creating an enabling environment for mobilizing the much-needed private investment in the off-grid space. I am hopeful that with successful private-public partnerships across the energy value chain, Liberia will be able to overcome its infrastructure constraints and be able to fully utilize its resource potential to foster environmentally sustainable economic growth and development. From the World Bank Group, I can assure you of our commitment to support the government in creating an enabling environment for mobilizing the required private investment to the energy sector. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Lauren. What an incredible uh, uh, session that was. Um, your chairing was wonderful as always, and what uh, an extraordinary lineup of speakers as well from both ambassadors and both ambassadors, uh, uh, starting with the Liberian ambassador in London. Thank you for giving us your premises to do this uh, uh, in the past um, a few hours. Thank you to the British ambassador and thank you to the um, the Embassy in Monrovia, who've provided the funding to make sure that this event took place. The wonderful Lord Sheikh, with that excellent, anecdotally rich, beautiful speech that you gave at the onset, and all of the incredible ministers and regulators that have spoken since, and especially I, as well to the World Bank, which really was a standout speech from uh, at the, the multilateral investment community there. Thank you so much for that. Um, as Lauren mentioned at the outset, we're now going to the interactive session. We'll do this switch over in a few minutes. You'll see on the right-hand side of your screen the joining instructions. You will have been sent these on your registration details last week. Uh, but if you do get stuck, they're there. Or if you get stuck and you have access to neither of those, please just email us very quickly at events at developingmarkets.com and we'll get that information to you. So now we reach the interactive session of the event. Um, if you'll join us in five minutes' time on Zoom, uh, that session will begin, and it will begin in London. Uh, after we have uh, introduced ourselves here, we will then pass over to the National Investment Commission uh, for them to introduce the, our Liberian counterparts. And the rest of the programme uh, you will have seen in the emails that have been sent uh, last week, and you'll see from the process today. Thank you so much to everyone that joined. Um, I really think in... Um, over 10 years of having uh, coordinated these events for um, various governments in, in Liberia, this has been the most informed uh, and joined up set of presentations that I've ever witnessed. So congratulations to the government for that. See you in a few minutes. Thank you.